Costa Rica in 2023. So uh, the first seminar of the year will be about Carmenes Plus, an update of uh, Carmenes and the impact on its science, and will be given by Roberto Varas, who works here at, here at IEA. So Roberto studied uh, aerospace engineering in the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid, and then he made a master and on uh, space science and technology uh, in the Universidad de Paisa. Uh, then he uh, started working in, instrument in instrumentation, uh, working on a polarimeter for the New Robotic Telescope in La Palma. Then he got a summer grant to work at the Instituto de Astrofisica Canarias in Tenerife. And after this, that grant, he came here to IEA to work in the Universidad and the Unidad de Desarrollo Instrumental y Tecnológico. Uh, so as uh, mechanical engineering, Many different projects, Carmenes in the Observatory of Nevada, too, etc. And since November, he's making a PhD working on Carmenes, uh, studying exoplanets on MUARS, and the scientific case for Marcot, working with Pedro Amado. So, we will be talking about Carmenes Plus, so the floor is to you. Thank you very much. Everyone, as my presenter said, I'm Roberto Varas, working at the UDIT, and today we'll be talking about Carmenes Plus and the upgrade on the cooling system. First of all, I would I will like to thank you all the all my colleagues, Rocio Calvo, Pedro Amadeo, Santiago Ferreira, and all the Calabarco staff that has been doing a great job for what I will be presenting today. The outline is as follows. Let's take out this, otherwise you won't see the titles. Uh, first, I will be talking about the overview of cameras as an instrument and then our the cooling system of the near infrared spectrograph description. And then the next step is to talk about Carmenes Plus, the project, first the goals, the timeline so far, and the upgrades. And once presented the upgrades, the next step is to talk about the new performance of the near infrared, the science that we can do with this new stability of the instrument, and uh, working with Carmenes as a visible plus near infrared, near infrared uh, instrument. Okay. The chat is. <laughs> okay. So, first, the Carmenes overview. Carmenes means uh, somehow a uh, color of high resolution search for M dwarfs with X red, with near infrared and optical SL spectrographs. And basically, it's all the description of the instrument placed at the 3.5 meter telescope in Caralto, observing with two spectrographs, one in the visible and one in the near infrared making radar velocity measurements with the goal of detecting uh, exoplanets around uh, late type main sequence stars in the habitable zone. And the observation started in 2016 and was planned to work until 2020. And then Carmen Plus uh, came to, to extend and to improve the performance of the instrument. Here we have a, a table with all the basic uh, parameters of the instrument, but let's see some cool images. Here we have the 3.5 meter telescope, very impressive. But if we can, if we see on the on the right, a zoom of what is the Cassegrain focus, uh, there's a black cylinder with the law of Carmenes because that is what we call the front end. All the light comes from the telescope to that point, and some fibers, uh, fibers takes the light just below this uh, technical floor, like we can see here, where the spectrographs are. Here we have an image of the uh, uh, a view of the instrument on the clean room of the audit with all the stuff that actually make this possible. Uh, the big cylinder on the on the upper part is the, the the outer layer of the spectrograph. That is what we call the vacuum chamber. That is the first layer that allows us to be under vacuum conditions. The next layer is this the radiation seal. Okay, and if we remove this uh, layer, we have the optical bench with all the optics, that is the actual uh, spectrograph itself. Okay, so that's from the overview of Carmenes and now the cooling system of the near infrared uh, channel. Because we're, we're, we're looking at the near infrared, we, we want to work at approximately 140 Ks. Uh, so we need a lot of stuff to make this possible. And the cooling system uh, has. The, as I said, a lot of players. The first one is the vacuum chamber that is here is almost invisible. <laughs> um, that basically allows us to be under vacuum conditions. So the convection and the heat load of the air is almost uh, uh, eliminated. 
the next day is the radiation seal that by definition minimizes the heat load coming from the radiation but here in Calmenes makes another huge role that is basically to cool down the system okay as I say we want to work under uh, cryogenic uh, conditions we actively pull down the radiation seal with these purple boxes that we can see attached to the radiation seal is what we call the heat exchangers on the top and I want you to Keep in mind this because it will be very important to, to understand how it works. And then inside of this, we have the optical beds. That is the part that we actually want to uh, pull down. Okay. Uh, I hope that this doesn't uh, disturb us anymore. But okay. So this is these are the layers of the spectra. Okay. And the cooling system that is the part that concerns us is uh, with a easy sketch that we can see here. The first step is the blue bottle on the bottom with the number one, that is uh, where the liquid nitrogen is, uh, is inside a, a, what we call a dewar or a, or a tank of 350 liters. This gives us a liquid nitrogen to the orange part, that is the next step, what we call the nitrogen gas preparation unit, the, or to be sort of preparation unit, that basically uh, evaporates the liquid nitrogen and give us a very stable flow of gas. Because this is what we are going to use to cool down the system. Then through the exits, we go to the inside of the instrument. And just before reaching the radiation seal, what we have is the flow splitters. The flow splitters basically split the flows. So we have a lot of different circuits of gas that goes to different parts of the spectrum to these small boxes that I told you before that are the heat exchangers. That is where actually the heat exchange between the radiation seal and the, and the gas happens. And then all the lights come together again and to the exit of the instrument. And just before going to the atmosphere, we have what we call the uh, on-off valve that basically allows us to control the flow. Okay, this is also a very important part of the system. It, it has only two states, open and closed. When it's closed, the flow remains, uh, or the gas remains inside the instrument, exchanging uh, heat with the, with the radiation seal. And when we open it, uh, the gas refresh on the lines, coming with new cool gas. Okay, so the, the, the working mode here is opening and closing the valve all the time. And with a PAT, an automatic method, what we do is to uh, keep the temperature as stable as possible. And just one last thing about this, and is that the bottle at the beginning where the liquid nitrogen is, uh, every morning is exchanged because we run, a, we run out of liquid. So we placed a new bottle. This also will play a huge role on the system. Here's just a 3D model of the, of the um, cooling system that is with the preparation unit on the left. Uh, then the gas comes to the system. Uh, we here can see the flow splitters and then the small boxes that are the heat exchangers. Um, and then also the vacuum vessel and the radiation seal. So this is for the description of the cooling system, okay? Now let's talk about Calmenes Plus. This is a big and a huge project that involves all the instruments, the visible spectrograph, the infrared spectrograph, the calibration unit, the pipeline, everything. But in this case, we're talking just about the uh, cooling system and the near infrared. So we have two main goals. The first one is to improve the stability of the temperature on the, in on the instrument. So we have uh, the capability to do more ambitious science. And the second one is to reduce the maintenance tasks that are needed to keep Calmenes working every day. The timeline is summary somehow in this chaotic line. Okay, a lot of things happened starting in 2020, as I told you, when Calmenes was supposed to, to end, Calmenes Plus starts. We have the COVID, we have uh, a lot of things, okay? But I want you to keep in mind just a few of them. The first one is February, 2021 when we discovered that the uh, preparation unit was broken and we don't have the capability of evaporating the liquid nitrogen. It wasn't until May that uh, there was an inspection that discovers that the heaters were broken. The heaters that allows us to evaporate the gas. Okay, at the same time, uh, we placed a, what we call a proportional valve. Remember that I told you we were working with an on-off valve. Basically, when you're working with, a, or with an on-off valve, we have what we call this continuous flow because you are opening and closing no other states in between. But with a proportion above, we have as, as many as states as we want between zero and one. So we have a continuous flow. 
Then on September of the same year, 2021, the preparation unit was repaired. And again, we have the capability of evaporating the gas. And the last um, date that I want you to keep in mind is May, May, the end of May, beginning of June of the past year, 2022, when we made the last uh, or the biggest upgrade of all of them that I will be explaining, so don't worry. And it's called Fixed the War. Okay, this is uh, the end of May, 2022. Here we can see the, the broken heaters. We have uh, on the right an image showing uh, this, uh, this they're, they're basically resistors that are broken, so we cannot evaporate uh, anything. There's uh, also an interesting image on the left that is showing the inside of the preparation unit. This is the first heat exchanger that is in charge of evaporating the liquid nitrogen. Then we have uh, different uh, stages that keeps the, the flow very stable before exiting the system. And now we have this, uh, the preparation unit repaired on the left, the same disk as before, but outside of the preparation unit and the test that we performed to see that everything was going fine. That's for the milestones so far. Uh, now let's talk about the upgrades. The first one is the one that I told you about the continuous and discontinuous flow mode. We basically install it in parallel to the on-off valve at the uh, proportional one in parallel because we wanted to always have a backup in case that it doesn't work as we planned. Uh, so it starts working on a continuous flow. Here on the bottom, on the left, we have an image showing how it works with the on-off valve. Uh, on red, it is the state of the valve that is going back and forth, opening and closing all the time, as I told you. And the temperature in black that is following this uh, behavior going back and forth, back and forth. So we can see this is a source of instabilities. That's why we choose to go to a continuous flow mode. And basically the difference uh, is very easy to understand. We in red have the, the discontinuous mode flow, sorry, going back and forth, back and forth. And in blue, when the continuous flow was performed, very stable. So uh, the first improvement with this upgrade is very noticeable. The next one is what we call the automatic uh, system, uh, vacuum system for transfer lines. But first I want to uh, explain a little bit why we had to implement this upgrade. We basically have a vacuum uh, conditions on the system, okay? And if you perform vacuum as of, on an instrument or in a, in a system and you let it go without any, doing anything at all, we lose these vacuum conditions over time. We have, we have a degradation of the vacuum. So when the vacuum is lost, we have a bigger heat load coming from the convection. So the temperatures start, start to rise. About a rate of one K per month until we decide that this is too much. So we do what we call a vacuum pre-generation. We basically do a, again vacuum to keep the, the pressure under the levels that we want it. And this has also a huge impact as this thermal jump. So here are about uh, 13 Ks that we want to avoid because as I told you, the main goal is to have a long and short-term stability of the instrument. So basically to avoid this long-term thermal drift and the thermal jumps, we install this uh, system, automatic vacuum system, that keeps the pressure very stable around 10 to the minus seven millibars. Okay, and just uh, to show you very uh, easy at a glance how this works, we have two differences on the left before installing and on the right after installing it. There's two differences. The first one is that on the right, right now, uh, there's a lot of stuff in the same spot. It's very crowded that before it didn't have. But in exchange, we lose this uh, formation of ice that is surrounded by a red circle. That is uh, basically basically a sign of the lost vacuum. Okay. The next step was to implement a, a pressure control unit. First, I will I will tell you how this uh, how these problems happen to to need a pressure control unit. This is the, the, water, the, the bottle tank where the liquid nitrogen is that I told you at the beginning, that is at the very beginning of the cooling system. Basically, it's a bottle with some amount of liquid. But on the top, we have gas, nitrogen in gas phase that keep us with some pressure, some overpressure over the atmosphere. 
depending on this pressure, the amount of liquid nitrogen that goes to the system changes. So this is by basically how we uh, can extract the liquid from the bottle with the overpressure. <clears throat> but there's some sources of instability that change this pressure. For example, the exchange of bottle every day or the lower of the level. <coughs> we have a bit, when, when the liquid is uh, lowering, the gas uh, volume is increasing, so the pressure lowers. In order to avoid this source of instability, because we have what we want is a very stable flow of gas to the system, we have changes on the flow. We have no, uh, we have not this condition. We install what we call the pressure control unit that basically is in charge of keeping the pressure around 0.41 and 0.42 bars over the atmosphere. It has two working modes. The first one is when the pressure is too high, we basically exhaust the gas to the atmosphere. And when it's too low, we inject gas with this secondary bottle that is called the buffer D1 uh, to the system to keep the pressure in between. We don't do it manually, it's basically automatic. And the difference is very huge. On the left, again, animals showing the pressure. On red, before placing this PCU, with a lot of changes of temperature, every, uh, pressure, sorry, every day and every night. And uh, in black, we have these uh, very, very small changes of the pressure. So this is also a very huge improvement in terms of stability. Again, more things going on in the same room. It's getting very crowded. You can see here the, the, the bottle that is uh, feeding the system and the PCU. And finally, the biggest upgrade that I told you that happened at the end of May 2022. Well, this arises from, the, from a fact that I didn't explain yet, that, uh, that is uh, um, a bad side of the exchange of bottle. Okay, every morning we run out of liquid nitrogen, so we want to, exchange, uh, to take out this bottle and put a new one. In the time in between, we take the, the first out and we place the second one, we are not taking liquid nitrogen to the system. So we are basically not cooling down. We, we are, there, there's a small time that basically there's no liquid nitrogen. So this is also a huge uh, source of instability for the temperature, as we are going to see very soon with some images. So the solution was basically to design a, what we call the fixed dewar, that is one bottle that is always feeding with liquid nitrogen. And when the, the, the fuel or the liquid is too low, the level, we refill the same bottle with a secondary one that is here in orange. Uh, every morning we put uh, this second bottle full of liquid nitrogen towards the other one, open the valve, and basically refill the other one. So there's always a flow to the system of liquid nitrogen. There's still some uh, small instabilities for this process because it's very uh, chaotic in, in the reality because thermodynamics are always uh, very <laughs> exhausting. But the PCU plays a, a really huge, uh, plays a really huge role on, on keeping the, the pressure inside the bottle very stable to have uh, a very stable also uh, flow to the system. Again, more, more stuff on the same room, uh, very crowded now. And the temperature, uh, the temperature image that I want to show you. In red, we have previously this upgrade, previously refilling the bottle when we replaced every morning this Dewar. And we, we can see that every day there's a huge jump on the temperature, a huge jump on the temperature. That basically is resetting the system every day. And this reflects directly on the radar velocity measurements. And after uh, we implement this fixing the work, we have the blue line that is quite more stable. We have still some instabilities, but it's uh, in another league, let's say, okay? But uh, ultimately what we want to do is to make radar velocity measurements. So how this translates to the radar velocity. Before going to the graphic, I want you to explain uh, what we call the nightly drift of the radar velocity. It's an easy concept, but it's, I think it should be explained. Every night, what we do is uh, some, some calibrations of the night to see how the instrument is performing, radial velocity calibrations. And the first one, we set it to zero. So the rest of the calibration during the night are referred to this first one, okay? We do this every night. The first one is zero and the rest 
are referred to this one. We want to be this trip that is the all the, the radar velocity calibration measurements altogether. We want it to be as small as possible because we want to make very accuracy and very stable measurements. So this should be as close as zero as possible. And here we can see the impact of this last upgrade. The black line represents the end of May 2021, 2022, sorry, when we implemented this uh, new configuration. So on the left, we have the system with all the upgrades except this last one, and on the right, all together. And the difference is huge. Okay, we basically have this, this nightly drift that is quite smaller now than before. So the improvement uh, is quite not, noticeable. Okay, then we are going to talk about the numbers. So it, it will be easier to understand all of this. And just to finish with the upgrades, I want to talk about the future work that is even ongoing, some of them, as they refilling every two days. Instead of one day, we just put a little bit more of liquid nitrogen and the system is able to, to be uh, even two days working with the same bottle. So the, this impact on the refill is uh, every two days instead of every day. So this is also an improvement on the long-term stability. We want to make this process also very automatic because right now it's mostly manually, the open of the valve and so on. And it's very demanding from the color to stop and also it's less optimized. Uh, what is also going on, it's the migration of the control system to a more powerful PLC. So it is easier and basically better uh, control the proportion above and all, all of the system itself. And finally, in case that this is not enough for fulfilling the requirements, what we have is a new preparation unit called the Evolution or the Evo, and a preliminary design is on, on the right. And the next step is to talk about the performance. Explain all the upgrades, what is the result on the instrument. First, uh, we're going to talk about these calibrations, these nightly drips, okay? That is basically what is shown on the left. We're going to be comparing the pre carmenes Plus era to the post carmenes Plus. pre carmenes Plus is just until uh, February 2021 when the preparation unit broke and always with the on-off valve, so with the discontinuous mode flow. And in blue, we are going to explain the post carmenes Plus. That is uh, <coughs> after this last upgrade on May 2022. So we have the calibrations and the nightly drift for every night. But these are just graphics, as we can see on the top for the pre carmenes Plus, in the bottom after carmenes Plus. Uh, just to no notice that on top we have this behavior that is going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth of the radar velocity. That is just uh, what happens with the temperature. That's why we want a very uh, uh, stability of the temperature on the system because it is directly reflect on the measurements. And to represent these graphics, to have some numbers, we took two values. Okay, the first one is the peak to peak, the maximum difference that in the end, because we want it to be as small as possible. So this is a reflect of how small the radio velocity or how big this, the radio velocity drip is. And the second one is chose because we also want to be the radio velocity drift very smooth, because we can do some uh, calibrations and some uh, corrections to the results if we have these values, but, but if it is very erratic as it, as it is on the top, the corrections are going to be uh, not very useful. But if it is smooth as in the bottom, the, the, the values are going to be, or the corrections are going to be very valuable for us. And the smoothness, we measure it via the root mean square uh, value. That is basically, first we do a quadratic fitting to the data, that is the black line shown in the figures. And to the residuals of this fitting, we make this root mean square method. And that is the second value representing every night. Okay, so we have the peak to peak value. That is the maximum difference, how big the, the, the drift is. And the root mean square, the root mean square value. That is how smooth the, the drift is during the night. And because we have a lot of data, a lot of nights, we are going to do a statistical analysis on the left for the peak to peak on the right for the root mean square, in blue, the post-carmenes plus, and in red, the pre-carmenes plus. 
And at the top, uh, we placed the median of the distribution. And it's easy to notice that the improvement is very huge. We come from 30 meters per second to just 17, almost a factor of two. And it's even bigger on the root mean square when we come to from 4.7 meters per second to just 1.6. So now the, the drift every night is smaller and smoother. And if we see the distribution is also uh, uh, quite better because it's more to the left and higher. So we have more common lower values. So also the long-term uh, stability has improved. Nevertheless, we, give in, we should keep in mind that uh, we are comparing uh, years of data, previously Carmen's Plus, with uh, months of data after Carmen's Plus. So we, we need to keep uh, we collecting this data to see if this is actually the reality of uh, it isn't. And the second step is to compare with the visible spectrum. Why with the visible spectrum? Because it is quite better. The performance is quite better for all the history of the instrument. So we set this as a reference. We want to be at the precision that the visible has on the radar velocity. So we do the exactly the same analysis than before. Here in green, we saw the visible results. And uh, what we can see on the top with the millions is that we're very close to be at the visible performance, but we're not yet at the same level. Okay? So we hope that with the new upgrades and the optimization that I explained the, with the future work, we can be even closer to this performance of the instrument. So this is all the analysis for the intrinsic performance of the instrument. Only talk about calibrations, how the instrument works uh, itself. Now we're going to see how it performs on sky, if there is any improvement when looking at standard stars. Because in cameras we have six standard stars. So here in the graphics, uh, that I observe very, very usually and selected because they change, uh, they, they don't change a lot over time. So the measurements should be very stable. Uh, on the left, we have basically the number of observations that we have for each standard star. There are plenty more of them on the pre carmen Plus era, basically, basically because there's years of data and now just uh, several months. But uh, with a little more of data, we can we can see if this is also the reality of something is changing, changing. Maybe we have even a bias. But for the moment, what we do is to take all the observations for each star and each four, okay, pre post carmen Plus, and we do the good mean square value of all the measurements and the standard deviation of the errors. And what we plot is on the right, the value of the root mean square of all the observations and the error bars are the standard deviation of the errors of each measurement. And we got, what we basically can see is that just with one exception, that is BD plus 11, 27, is uh, that the errors are uh, quite smaller. The values are also smaller, but the errors are very, very, much lower than, than previously Carmenes Plus. And it is also shown on the distribution on the Instagram, Instagram of the errors. Okay, we can see that they are more concentrated around a lower value. On the left, we have pre Carmenes Plus, and on the right, we have post Carmenes Plus. And it's very obvious that with just the exception of the red line, that is the same as before, all the values are uh, concentrated around a lower value. So this is also a huge improvement when comparing the near infrared before and after cameras plus. But what, what happens when we compare again with the PC? Okay, we didn't make a lot of observations in this sense, a lot of uh, studies, but we first we know for sure uh, there is a fact that there's more information on the spectrum on the visible bandwidth that it is on the near infrared. But in case they both had the same information because the instrument is performing very close to the visible level, the signs that we can that we can down we can do sorry should be very similar from the visible but for the in near infrared. Nevertheless, this should be tested because we also have the front end, the fibers, the mirror of the telescope that are basically optimized for the visible, and also the 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 effects of the atmosphere and the star variability that for sure are different from the near infrared than from the visible. So this can limit or or accuracy in both spectrums. But there's good news because if we go to the latest spectral types from M6 to M9, what we can see is that the signal to noise ratio 
is almost at the same level for both parts of the spectrum. Basically, even though we have more information on the visible, the stars emit more on the near infrared because they are cooler. And if we go to later spectral types, M8 and M9, the radio velocity precision in theory is even better for the near infrared. So this is good news because if we have a very stable near infrared spectrograph, we can actually go to this limit, performing even better than the visible. So that's why we want to work with Carmenes as a visible plus near infrared spectrograph, because until now, this wasn't a reality, okay? The, the, we, we could do a lot of science with the infrared before, but now with the new stability, this is going to improve, for sure. And there are plenty of interesting cases uh, scientifically. Uh, the, the first three, I, I put just five bullets of interesting cases. The first three ones are basically about the chromaticity, because if we do chromaticity analysis on the radar velocity, we can compare the stellar activity with the amplitudes of the, the radar velocity on both parts of the spectrum and talk about the disputed planets. This is the case, for example, as the co-rotating planets, such as ADLEO, where the near-infrared can uh, play a huge role in, in deciding and reinvestigating these cases. Also, the chromatic rosetier McLaughlin analysis that basically give, give us a lot of information about the orbital parameters of the planet and also the, the velocity uh, that the, the spin of the star is. And with a more stability and a more stable near infrared, we can go to smaller values and to more critical cases. And also no, not only the chromaticity, but also the atmospheres will benefit from a more stable uh, analysis. Also the, the telluric removal also be quite better. And we uh, have also the case of going to cooler and cooler the stars and detect uh, exoplanets around this place. I want to extend a little bit just this last uh, point about the ultra cool dwarfs and brown dwarfs because there's a lot of stuff going on there that we don't know uh, because we see a trend on the latest spectral types that uh, the number of exoplanets detected is going uh, higher and higher on small exoplanets. And we want to know if this is also true for the coolest uh, stars on the from, for the brown dwarfs, that there's no, no population known about exoplanets on brown dwarfs. So it's also very interesting. And in the case of transiting planets around cool dwarfs and ultra cool dwarfs, uh, the atmospheric analysis, again, will benefit for this analysis because they are best cases uh, for analyzing the atmosphere that the hottest stars. And just uh, as, a, as a last point, uh, the problems that we have when looking at cultural cool dwarfs and round dwarfs, basically the models are unconstrained because there are not a lot of uh, detections. We also know that they are very fast rotators and there's just few things that we can do about this. And it's just to say the slowest ones. And finally, we know that they are faint. So this is why basically there's not a survey about these uh, exoplanets uh, around ultra cool dwarfs, but there's some things that we can do about the faintness of the, of the stars, and it's going to bigger telescopes. And that's when uh, Marcot, Marcot comes to play. There is a project going on uh, between the IAA and the Caralto staff, and it's basically to go to a 15 minutes uh, telescope so we can even connect Carmenes to this telescope and have a bigger surface so we have a better signal to noise ratio and all these problems that we are seeing here are going to be uh, less important and this is the conclusions summary but uh, the, the zoom doesn't allow us to see that they are the conclusions but we basically talk about a cooling system and then all the upgrades. The first part of the analysis of the results was to see the intrinsic performance of the instrument and was easy to see that it was performing quite better than before, but we are not yet at the level of the visible. That is all goal basically, to go to the same level of the visible. Then we talk about on-sky measurements. Uh, we need more data 
of uh, standard stars, and especially on the latest spectra types, because we want to go to ultra puntuals, but we don't have actually uh, standard stars on latest than M2. I think is the, the latest one on the on the standard stars, and we are planning to implement some standard stars uh, uh, around M6 and M7 or, or even later if we can. And finally, the, the ultimate goal is to see the capability of the instrument right now and with the future upgrades that we are planning, how we reach the theoretical performance, which is the actual accuracy, which is the limit now, and all this stuff, basically. If, if, how are we performing and which, which are the cases that we can, we can reach with the, with the level? Because we want to, to use Carmines finally as a visible plus near instrument and do this chromatic analysis that I explained and also to see the atmosphere of the planets, even on the latest spectra types. So that's basically my presentation. If you have any questions, I will be pleased to, to ask them. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roberto, for this uh, talk. And as you say, if anybody has uh, questions, please uh, raise your hand. And uh, Francisco in the room can uh, manage it. Okay, Roberto. Uh, first of all, congratulations to you and all your team because it's a great job. And I say this because I'm not sure if the scientists know how how difficult this is to achieve this uh, precision and stability in temperature and in flow control and in, uh, finally in the radio. So it's a, a great, great job. So, great. <laughs> and in one of your first slides, you said that the goal was two meters per second in radial velocity in the long term, and uh, one meter per second in the short term, I think. Uh, in the conclusions you said, I, I'm not sure if I can I got that. You don't know how uh, what these these numbers are in in the pre plus in the precarbonous plus confirmation. Now, the near channel we don't know uh, which is the radial velocity precision or, or. This is a tricky question. Okay, I will I will explain it for sure. Uh, what's in my hand? Because um, there are several ways to compute a number to see which is the intrinsic performance, okay? But it depends on how you compute it, actually, how you calculate it, the number changes. So we have numbers from before Carmen's class, so in a certain number, that is probably what this refers to, because there's a lot of people also working on, key, on, on this, so it's uh, quite difficult to, to understand what they refer exactly. But basically, um, they compute a different analysis than this one I show you today. Uh, so we decided to take uh, another way to compute it because we also use the data what, that we had in, in our hand. And that's why I do the same analysis for the visible that for the infrared before and after Carmen's plus. And the numbers are not the, referred to these same numbers. That's something that we are working on it. We want to have this number precisely. Uh, the two meters per second uh, is not possible to compute it actually because it's over five years. So we need to see if this is actually happening. The one meter per second is easiest because it should be in the short term, I mean days. And this is something that we can actually uh, compute and we are actually trying to do it because we have two fibers. One is that on sky that we call the fiber A and we also have the fiber B, that is the one that makes the calibrations. It also changes a little bit when we are uh, observing with Carmenes that when we are not observing with Carmenes, these values, these drifts and the calibrations changes a little bit. So it's quite tricky to fully be sure that we are doing the, the, the best way to compute these numbers. So I'm sorry, because I'm probably not answering the question actually, but that's what we're at the moment. I hope I can give this number very soon. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Thanks, Roberto. I enjoyed the talk.
I didn't think before I came, because I'm always a technical talk, there's very little number there. Yeah, really have to have to Thank you very much. Um, very naive question, because I have absolutely no idea to prepare. Why do you have, why, why do you have to evaporate the nitrogen? Is the gas flow, is it just too difficult to, to handle liquid nitrogen, or is it more stable with the gas flow? What is the reason to do it? It is also a quite tricky question, but thank you very much again. Um, okay, it's because uh, the team just selected that uh, the working temperature will be 140 Ks. And in case you work with liquid nitrogen, you are working at lower temperatures. Basically, that is the concept. Okay. Uh, it is also because ESO participates on the design of this cooling system and wanted to try uh, the same concept that is used for the detectors. But uh, they wanted to, um, to to make sure that it happens also with the instrument that work, works well. In the end, it was quite harder than for the just the detectors. Uh, but basically, it's uh, because of that, because of the working temperature. All other instruments uh, use uh, liquid nitrogen for the detectors, also for all the instruments, but because they are uh, working at lower temperatures. Okay, thank you very much Grant, for the question. Uh, in case uh, from Zoom you didn't hear is basically what is my contribution to this work, my myself. Um, yeah, I didn't explain actually because uh, most of the work is not mine. <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, until 2020, 2022, uh, basically the beginning of, or the end of 2021, I didn't start working at the AIA. So all the work, all the, let's go to the, the upgrades, that is basically all the timeline until this moment, nothing is from myself. Okay, <laughs> but Rotio here did a, a, lot of, a lot of work, the automatic vacuum system that uh, refreshed the line and the vacuum uh, was uh, from her side, but for my side. Okay. Uh, I basically participate on the design of the preparation control unit. We basically do it here at the day at the Rocio and I. And then also with the Calaranto staff, we just do the, let's say, the theoretical part because they uh, implement all the upgrades and, and do all the manual stuff. Um, we, we have a, a really strong campaign also on the fixed DWAR when we were uh, refilling the process. I also participate strongly on, on, on this upgrade. We go several times to the observatory trying to, to see if this uh, works. And it, uh, it took us several months until it worked uh, well, because it looks very easy to refill just a bottle, but it's really, really, really hard because a lot of things are going on when, you, when you're doing this. And finally, the, the, I think my strongest contribution is uh, all the analysis of the temperature and all the statistical analysis of the relative velocities. Okay, all, all these plots are also, all, all the team, Rocío, and even in Calaralto, Pedro, uh, uh, Santiago Beteril, everybody participate, okay, on, on this, it's not only me, but it's uh, one main task was to analyze all this data. And also the on-sky uh, measurements with the standard, uh, standard stars is basically most my part, okay? But it's always a teamwork effort for sure. Thank you very much, Juan. Yeah, one minute. Stay on the slide if you uh, One of the questions is that you said that you usually wouldn't, and the error of the velocity for all of these, except, is it just one except? Uh, do you know why? Because the night was terrible because the planet is uh, oh. I don't know why. That's the sort of answer. Yeah, the, 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 the question was basically that if we know why we have this exception, the, the exception on BD 
uh, BD plus 11, 25, 67, 66. Uh, 76, sorry. Uh, on the middle, why this is the exception of, on the error bars. Uh, we don't know why, because we didn't look very much at this data. We, we want to have more data to analyze it. Because if you see the number of observations on this star is very low. On the three latest, we have more observations. So it's, uh, we can trust more this analysis. But it's, it's some, something that we need to work on it. Yeah, it could be the same. It could be also that is just a bias, or we don't know for sure. We the, the, the answer, the truth is, okay. I don't know. Uh -huh. I don't know, but I want to know it, so I will look. My main to question it. was another one, just that I okay. <laughs> uh, one of the computations, you say something that just for me to understand. Yeah, okay. But probably you explain, but I didn't understand very well. You say like uh, with, uh, yeah, that one. Wait, sorry. Yeah, with that particular part, I got those synthetic planets are small and the models. The models you are referring there are the plan formation models. Yeah, the plan formation models. Okay. Yeah, uh, there's also a little bit of this here. Like, does the population tend of small exoplanets extend into the UCD? Does the observable occurrence rate of Earth sized planets continue? Uh, digs from planets as efficient as, and also the migration uh, and the impact on the on the dependence on the star, because the models here are unconstrained, basically, the, 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 the plant formation. We can say that most of the planets are smaller than the planets. Yeah, but the trend that we refer here is that they increase the number of planets. If we go to, it happens before the M dwarfs also, that it uh, increases the number of exoplanets that we detect on the latest one, the smallest one, the smallest ones. So we want to know if we actually in the brown dwarfs we will be we will have more exoplanets than on them dwarfs or not. Thank you. We also have a question in the chat. Okay. But okay, let's start with you. Okay. okay. Can I see the, the new concept of the of the preparation the table? Yeah, for sure. It is very preliminary. Okay, we because we not decide if we need this or not. But yeah, we can make any question. For sure. Sorry, 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 sorry. Not sure. No. What's the difference or the idea in this in this concept? You have also three stabilization on three stages. Or? Yeah, the the main difference or the biggest difference is that in this case the progression unit is in vertical. You probably didn't notice, but before we have a horizontal preparation unit, and what we are, what we want to achieve with this is that in case we don't evaporate all the liquid nitrogen, all the liquid goes to the bottom, so the gas can close. Because sometimes we had problems with the actual preparation unit because a lot of liquid uh, stuck on the stage and the gas didn't uh, flow very well. So this is the biggest upgrade, but. But there's a lot of uh, difference because all the things that we have learned since the beginning of the of the instrument, we also want to change the the, the spot where the liquid or where the heaters are to evaporate the gas. We want to be on the bottom of this of this geometry. We also want to be this uh, conic shape because in case also the, there is some water inside the system. It can form small uh, ice on on inside the the circuit, and this can also stack, and the gas is not allowed to flow. So if we have the same, probably it's going to happen here the ice, so it's not a problem. We also have to have we also want to have liquid inside the preparation unit before you keep you you go inside of the preparation unit and evaporate it immediately. Let's say, and now we want to have this. First stage that is in blue is going to have a uh, amount of liquid nitrogen. So we always have liquid liquid nitrogen inside the system, and the refilling refill is happening inside the system and not outside. Wow. So it's also uh, an important part. Always having liquid here and an evaporate from the surface. Is it, is it a real plant or I mean, is, is there a value for this? 
it is supposed to be money. The problem is that if we want, if it is worth it to spend that money on this or not, because they also want to upgrade the calibration unit. And uh, we saw that the improvement already is very huge. So maybe it's worth it to spend this money in the calibration unit better than on this. So it's only in case of necessity to, to take this plan. <clears throat> Uh, is Pedro Amado asking a question on the on the chat? I don't want. I don't know if you want me to read it. Yeah. Uh, Carlos asked. I think Carlos is already, and yeah, a visible plus in front for instrument. Maybe not yet for planetary studies and an accurate radio velocity measurement, but for higher resolution spectroscopy, it works quite well. Maybe the reduction pipeline should improve as well, providing data to the final user in more user-friendly format, thanks. And Pedro Mano basically responded that that is true. Maybe I exaggerated a little bit because I wanted to make a point and is that we need to improve the instrument and we're on, on, on the path, but it's true that Carmenes is quite su successful in the field. It's a, it's a reference both in the visible and the near infrared because there are a few cases that works as well as Carmenes. And Pedro says that even for planetary studies, but we are trying to reach, detect the smallest, more challenging planets. Or as the ultra cool dwarfs and the and working with the visible. Yeah, so yeah, but basically I exaggerated a little bit for sure. We have a visible plus infrared instrument, but we want to go even farther to actually have a same level instruments because we also have a problem on the infrared that is not from the instrument, but it's from the stars itself. We we have less information and we have a, when looking at the not latest but the the earliest spectral types. We have less information on the near infrared, and we're limited by the sky and not by the, the, the performance of the instrument. So, yeah, uh, Carmenes is a reference, and I know the one, the, the one that is going to deny this. But my, my point is basically that we want to go farther and farther on, on this and take the, the most out of Carmenes because we think it is possible. So, thank you for, for the question. Thanks for the question. <laughs> The of, uh, um, thank you for the question. He asked about uh, how it's going to to affect the uh, the calibration unit upgrade that I just mentioned. Okay, uh, basically, the the idea is to change how it actually works, not the strategy of observing. But right now, what we have is a mirror that is uh, dividing the. The light into several uh, into the instrument or the calibration unit, and what they want to have is with the fibers to have a fiber what we call a fiber switch that is basically easier to change from one mode to another, is fastest, and also this probably these changes that I just mentioned about the that there is different result when you are observing with cameras than when you are not. We don't have these moving parts, so it's basically the mechanics more than than the strategy of observing. And there is, is even a more ambitious, uh, ambitious plan that in, in involves also changing the plan because they want to have a more complex uh, calibration unit with a lot more of modes of, of working modes to have simultaneously the fiber E and the fiber B and not need to switch. Um, so it's basically uh, how it works actually more than, than the strategy of how many calibrations or which stars or which lamps are we using? I hope this answers the question. But this is a work uh, that is uh, going on. If you are interested, I can send you the, the info that we have. Already that is not a lot because it's uh, at the very beginning stage of the, of the project. Thank you for the question. <laughs> are there any questions in Rome? Renette, in Zoom? There is a question here at Zoom, Pedro, please. Yeah, hello. Hi, Roberto, thanks for the, um, for the talk. I had to join a little bit later because I, I had a telephone, so I couldn't uh, hear the first part of your talk, but I think I know what you, what you said. Um, more than a question, this is the comment, or a couple of comments. First on this uh, slide that you already have on the screen. 
for the for the uh, uh, in, uh, the preparation unit evo uh, design. Uh, um, I want to say uh, that regarding what you said about the or the question uh, on when uh, this could be implemented or or if it's going to be implemented. Um, there is, I think, one critical point, and that is that uh, the grapes that are we are currently uh, performing um, are trying and are stabilizing the instrument, but uh, we still don't know and cannot evaluate how robust these um, these solutions are. I mean, how well we can keep the stability in the long term. That is our final objective. So if this was not possible, because the solutions now were not robust, I think cameras, uh, the evolution design would would help us with that. And, uh, and in the end, if this happens, it will be needed to provide a more robust solution to the stabilization the, the, um, that in the end goes with the uh, stabilization of the, of the uh, liquid nitrogen. Uh, the, the the liquid gas that that flows within the spectrograph to stabilize thermally the instrument. So this is one was was one of the comments I wanted to make. The other one was related to the other question about the uh, calibration unit. Um, we are also uh, looking into the possibility of building a new Fabry Perot that that is going to be more stable and the. The, the one we have right now. Uh, this was one of the, Fabri, the, the first Fabri pedal that the team in Gottingen built for for any other in, for any instrument. Uh, this was the this was the first attempt to to their design of Fabri pedal, and it was installed in Carmes, and they have learned quite a lot since then. They have uh, built any many few more Fabri pedals for other instruments, and and they want to apply all this knowledge to the to this new design that will be installed in in Carmenes. Uh, we can take advantage of this better stability at the for the for the calibration light, and also um, several. Well, these two teams around the world have uh, contacted us to uh, to uh, use Carmenes Carmenes near infrared to make tests of their um, laser com. Uh, solutions for this uh, um, calibration light um, because there are no other instruments in the world that provide the stability in the near infrared that the carbonist gives. So they cannot carry out this kind of test in any, anywhere observationally on the sky, but for but with the uh, carbonist. So the, the, this is another possibility that if those tests are, are successful and we have we can manage to uh, raise the funds. We may, at some point, uh, this, uh, think about um, purchasing one of these uh, laser con solutions for for Carmen in the future. Okay, thank you Pedro, for the comments. Any further questions in Zoom? Right. No, no more questions. I think we can close. So yeah, so let's thank uh, Roberto. Eh?